line, U.S. and NATO forces surged into Afghanistan. Troop numbers escalated dramatically in preparation for this massive offensive against the Taliban. During this surge, a very small team of Marines, eight Marines, were given a mission to go to an observation post in Helmand province where a group of British soldiers were stationed at the time. An observation post, or OP as it's called in the military, is any location where you're able to observe, hence the name. Most OPs, if not all OPs, are located on high ground because that provides you the best view. OPs are very strategically valuable. You have the higher ground and you can see what's going on around you. And so as a result, OPs become prime targets for attack. Now, the OP that these Marines were going to, OP Rock, was a little bit unique. It was strategically very important, but it didn't really have the higher ground. All around it were other large pieces of terrain, which meant if you poke your head up for too long, you might get shot from a sniper on the mountain. And so OP Rock was like a very dangerous and isolated place to be. Not to mention laughably small and had almost no amenities. It was basically a couple of HESCO barriers, those big brown squares that get filled with sand and dirt to stop bullets. And then, you know, not even cots. They slept literally on the ground on sleeping pads and a couple of gilly tents overhead. That was about it. And so these Marines were going to be there for 60 days where they were not gonna be able to go anywhere. They were just isolated and stuck on this tiny little wasteland in the middle of Afghanistan. The eight Marines were led by Sergeant Green and his second in command was Corporal Lena. The other six junior Marines were Zolik, Hoyt, Wilson, Parker, Smith, and Gibbs. After driving their up-armored vehicles all the way through the snaking pass, they get to OP Rock, and the British soldiers are there anxiously waiting for them. Normally, anytime you turn over with any other unit, you do something called turnover operations, where because you're new to the area, you wanna go out and do like a presence patrol or something to get a feel for the area with the people who have been there to kind of give you a lay of the land and say, hey, look out for this area. We think there's IEDs over there. Remember, if you're over here, you're in plain sight of the enemy, they can shoot you. But when they got there, the British were so anxious to leave. They did not do turnover ops. The British just looked totally weathered and beaten down and ragged like they'd been fighting at OP Rock for decades they'd only been there for 60 days, the same amount of time that these Marines are about to be there. And before they leave, one of the British soldiers turns and says, hey, just so you know, if you dig anything up here, just put it back. And the Marines look at him like, what are you talking about? And he doesn't elaborate. He just says again, if you dig anything up, just put it back, trust me. So that night, the men have settled into their new home for the next 60 days. And the way it works on any base in the world, but certainly in a war zone, is there's always someone manning a guard post. And so the first night, it happened to be Corporal Lena's turn to be on watch. Corporal Lena is the second in command of these eight Marines. And he was up in the guard tower. And you gotta put yourself in his mind, okay? Even if you've never been to Afghanistan, just imagine being out in the middle of nowhere, like in the middle of a mountainous, desert with no village, no people, no anything. But at the same time, you are hanging it out there. You are totally exposed. There are people in the mountains around you that want to kill you, for sure. And it's you and seven other sleeping people right in your little tiny OP. All you got is a radio where you can call back to your main base that's far enough away that if something bad happened, you better hope that one, you can get through to them, and two, they can get over here as quickly as they can. And the great fear when you're in these remote locations is that you're gonna get ambushed. There's so many stories about these complex attacks being launched on these small little outposts where all of a sudden, groups like these eight Marines just get totally overrun by the Taliban. So it's a terrifying thing. When I was in Afghanistan, I didn't stand all that much guard duty, but when I did, you know, you're up, you're up in the shack and you're kind of looking out into this like vast expanse of kind of nothingness. And you're wondering like, are people watching me right now? You know, is someone taking aim at me right now? I mean, you're protected and you're, you're doing all the things you're supposed to do, but nighttime in Afghanistan, standing guard duty, it's very eerie. And so this first night, Lena is up there, it's very quiet and his radio that's right next to him, like imagine like a big walkie talkie, right? Military grade radio, it starts crackling. Military radios, at least American military radios are from the 1950s and they've basically not changed. 
They're very durable and they work, but it's not uncommon for them to falter. And that's why we have people that specialize in just radios that can fix these things for us. Because if you lose your line of communication, you, you're screwed. And so he's sitting there and he starts hearing crackling on the radio. And so he, he just, he notices it, but he doesn't think much of it. And the crackling stops and he's looking out into the mountainside and he's kind of looking around and just doing his typical guard duty. Then the crackling picks up again and he thinks he can hear someone speaking in the radio. It didn't sound like English. It didn't sound like even words necessarily, but it was a little bit louder. Now he's really paying attention to it. Because he was worried his radio might be going bad, he first took the battery off, looked at it, blew it off, reconnected the battery, rebooted it, and put it back down. And he's a little more keyed into his radio. And then a couple minutes later, he hears this crackling, and now he can clearly hear someone's voice. And it sounds like Russian. You th think someone is speaking in Russian. This is an encrypted radio. You're not picking up random signals all over the place. You, you only are picking up people that have your crypto. And it doesn't make any sense to pick up somebody else's voice. This has to be someone on your team. And so he thinks, okay, I'll just, I'll check in with, the main base because my guys are all asleep right here. They're all sleeping right there, seven of them. There's no beds. They're laying on the ground right there. I can count them. No one's on the radio. So he picks up the radio and he calls into the main base and he says, hey, is anybody pushing traffic out this way to OP Rock? And like right away, they get a response from, from the main base that says, no, we're, we're not pushing or receiving traffic. Lean is not terrified about this, but he's like, okay, there's something going on with the radio. The crackling and gurgling and weird sounds would persist throughout the night to the point where the next morning when the next guard came on duty, he said, hey, I think there's something strange going on with the radio. You should probably go switch it out and get somebody else's radio while you're up here. Lena's relieved of guard duty and he goes down to check on the other Marines. And at this point, everybody's awake and you know it's the start of their first full day at OP Rock. And because they have nothing else to do besides defend it, they start taking stock of how well fortified is it? What are some ways that we can improve this place? And they notice that there's a trench dug around the inside of, of OP Rock, basically right up against the Hescos, that allows anyone to stand and not be jutting out of the OP and run the risk of getting shot by a sniper. And they're looking at it and they're thinking to themselves, it's not deep enough. It's maybe a couple feet down. You're certainly not gonna be able to stand on this trench. You'll totally be exposed. And they thought, why didn't the British, who were here for 60 days, why didn't they dig a deeper trench? And so Lena and the rest of the Marines decide they're gonna spend that day digging the trench a little bit deeper and a little bit wider. As they're digging, Lena hits something metal in the trench and he pulls it out and it's like this metal stake, like an engineering stake. And he brushes off the dirt on the stake and he's looking at it and he can see some foreign writing and it looks like Russian writing. And he's thinking to himself, oh, that's not that weird. Back in the 80s, the Russians were here and it's totally possible that they may have left some of their gear here and it got buried. About 10 meters away from Lena is one of the younger Marines named Wilson who's digging. And at some point he hits the ground and like a pocket in the soil opens up. And he sees there's some pottery and some pieces of what look like ceramics that are inside of this, this hole. And after pulling out some of the plates and pots, they pull out a huge human bone, a femur, your leg bone. They ultimately decide to tuck the leg bone back into where it was, and they stop digging in that area, and they continue to dig in the other sections of the trench. But they couldn't dig more than a couple inches before running into more human remains. And by the end of the day, they had unearthed dozens of skeletons inside of this trench. And so they realized that this is probably what the British meant when they said, if you dig something up, put it back. A couple of weeks go by and the Marines at this point have accepted that they live in a very creepy place. And on day 13 of being at OP Rock, Hoyt, who had just turned 20 years old, is up on guard duty. As he's sitting there, he starts getting this really uncomfortable feeling that someone is right behind him. And so at one point, he turns around to look at what's behind him, basically looking back into the camp itself. And now coming from outside the wire where he had just been looking, he hears this horrible blood curdling scream. He turns around and he's looking out. He's got his night vision goggles on. He's looking around for anything. And all of a sudden, a couple hundred meters away, he sees a man running between one bush to another bush. Now they know that at any time they could get attacked. 
So they're not thinking that this could be anything other than the Taliban coming to attack them. And so the other Marines have jumped up because they heard the scream and they're looking to Hoyt to be like, what's going on? Hoyt is saying to them, I got a guy, he's about 200 meters away. I just saw him running right to left. Lena runs over to the edge of the HESCO and he raises his rifle with a thermal imager on it. And he's looking out and there's no heat signature out there. It's totally cold. There's no animals, there's no people, certainly, there's nothing. And Lena is yelling to Hoyt, where is he? Where do I need to look? And Hoyt's saying, he's right there. I just saw him go behind that bush. But Lena is looking out and he can't see anything on thermal. And he's like, I don't see anything. There's no one out there. The Marines also had a dog that they inherited from the British soldiers that had been there. Her name was Ugly Betty. They loved Ugly Betty, they took care of her, and she was apparently really good at identifying when people were coming towards the OP. So she was a great watchdog. And this whole time she had been looking in the same direction that Hoyt had seen this figure and she is barking like a maniac. And even after they're looking with thermal and they can't see anyone out there, they can't get Betty to calm down. She's completely transfixed on the area where Hoyt had seen this figure. So for the rest of the night, the Marines are totally on guard, anticipating at any moment that they're going to get attacked. Someone's going to take a shot, they're going to throw a grenade in, because we lost this guy who was right there in front of us. So eventually, the next day, when they didn't get attacked, they just kind of said, okay, and they moved on and just figured it was an anomaly. Another couple of weeks later, on day 26, Zolik, who's another one of the younger Marines, was on guard duty, and it was really hot. He remembers even taking his helmet off because he was sweating so bad. And then at some point, while he's just looking out into the vast open nothingness, he said that the temperature dropped inside of the shack dramatically. So much so that he actually felt cold. There was no breeze, there was no reason for it to be getting cold. And as he's thinking to himself, like, is there a storm coming in or a cold front coming in? He starts feeling like someone's standing behind him. And he keeps looking over his shoulder and no one's there. He's in this tiny little shack. And he just, he's feeling creeped out. And all of a sudden he starts hearing whispering from behind him. Not on the radio, but like in the shack with him. And he keeps turning around and he keeps thinking like, am I hearing things? Am I losing my mind? And he starts hearing footsteps on the roof of his shack. And that's when he thinks, oh, Smith, who was the kind of class clown of the group is playing a joke on me. He must be whispering outside. I bet he climbed up on top and he's screwing with me. So he jumps out of the shack and looks up expecting to see Smith standing on the roof of the guard shack, but no one's on the guard shack. At this point, Zolik's pretty spooked. He does a quick search on either side of the guard shack, thinking maybe Smith is there, but no one's there. And then he turns around and, of course, sees that the other seven Marines are all asleep. So it wasn't Smith. It wasn't any of his teammates. At this point, he goes back in the shack and he raises his rifle and he's looking through his thermal scope. So any human would light up like a Christmas tree if you if you saw them on a thermal. And he's scanning outside all around, thinking, did, did I hear someone who's out there? because they had that weird run-in two weeks earlier with that random person that they could never find. He's thinking maybe there's somebody else out here. And as he's scanning, he sees a man standing a couple hundred meters away with his fists raised like this. Zolik was so caught off guard from the way he was standing that he actually lowered his rifle to look because the moon was pretty bright. The illumination was pretty good. And he looked, he couldn't really see him again. So he brought his rifle back up and now through his thermal, the figure was gone. Zolik in interviews has admitted that he was really stressed out about being at OP Rock. He was really down. I think of all the Marines there, he was depressed. He did not want to be there. He felt like he was experiencing real combat fatigue. And he thought at this moment that he's losing his mind between the whispering and the footsteps on the roof and seeing this person with his fist raised. And so instead of telling people that he had potentially just seen this person out along the perimeter of their OP, he started to convince himself that you're just losing your mind. You're stressed and you're hallucinating. You just gotta calm down. For the rest of the night, he would not see the figure on his thermal or anybody out there, but he would hear whispering behind him. He kept hearing footsteps on the roof, but he would go out and no one would be there. So by the time the sun came up, he really thought that he was kind of losing his mind. And so he went to his leadership, Sergeant Green and Corporal Lena, and he told them about what had happened the night before, about you know, seeing the figure that had disappeared and hearing these whispers and the footsteps. I mean, he really thought that he was losing it and he requested to be transferred and they granted it to him. And the other seven Marines were really upset about that. They felt like he was kind of abandoning them and they were really critical of the reason for him leaving. They're like, oh, you're just playing the crazy card. You're just making that up so you can leave this crappy place that we don't want to be here either. So they were not taking seriously what he claimed happened. 
They just believed he was using the crazy card to get out of being at OP Rock. Just a couple of days after Zolik's departure, Lena is on guard duty in that guard shack. And as he's looking out, Ugly Betty starts barking really aggressively towards the area that Lena is looking at. And so he raises his night vision goggles and he's scanning the mountainside looking for any sign of people that perhaps Ugly Betty has sensed. And he stops when he sees what he believes is a Taliban scout standing on the mountainside, who's pretty far away, a few hundred meters away. And he switches to his thermal scope to confirm that it's a person before he engages. And when he raises his thermal scope, there's nobody there. There's no heat signature anywhere. But Ugly Betty is still barking like a maniac in the direction of where this potential scout was standing. And so Lena goes back to his night vision goggles like a second later and he's looking and he sees the same scout now about 100 meters closer to him, way closer to him. Like impossible to cover that distance in that amount of time. He practically falls over when he sees it. He switches to his thermal and he's getting ready to engage, but there's nothing there. And this is all happening in a matter of seconds. He goes back to his NVGs and he's looking and there's nothing there. And as he's about to go to his thermal for one last look, he feels a tap on his shoulder, which he believes is gonna be one of the other Marines that must've heard him frantically moving around in the guard shack. And when he turns, there's no one there. There's no one anywhere near the shack. All seven are asleep in the middle of the camp. At this point, Lena felt bad because he was critical of Zolik who had left because he had heard voices and seen apparitions out in the distance. And here's Lena, the second in command of the group having the exact same experience. But over the next 10 days, Hoyt, Smith, and Wilson would all have very similar experiences in that guard shack. And after a while, they all began sharing their stories and they all realized that Zolik probably wasn't lying and we were, we were unfair to be critical of him because we've all experienced this now. Then on day 59, the day before they're scheduled to leave, all of their radios go dead, all of them. And Lena goes over to Gibbs, who was their comms guy, and he's like, what's going on? And Gibbs was like, I've been working on the radios this whole time we're here. I've changed nothing. They've always worked. Now they did have a satellite phone, but it was an unreliable way to get in touch with reinforcements if you really needed it. They're pretty much isolated at this point, And they're all just sitting there, just hoping they can get through one more night without any problems. Wilson is the one actually in the guard shack. And then all of a sudden machine gun fire opens up right outside of their base. And Wilson is totally caught off guard. He has no idea where it's coming from. He's trying to call it out to the guys where they're getting shot from. And all the other Marines are scrambling to the walls. They're taking cover behind the Hescos. And as they're laying there, Lena runs up into the guard shack with Wilson. He's like, he grabs him and he's like, where are they shooting us from? And Wilson's like, I have no idea. And it's like, so, it's so loud. There's all this gunfire coming in at them. And as Lena and Wilson are trying to figure out where this is coming from, they hear the distinctive sound of an RPG being fired at them. It's a rocket propelled grenade. It's like a whistling sound and they know it's gonna hit them at any moment. The two of them brace for impact and they hear the sound of this RPG smashing on the side of the OP. And the machine gun fire is just continuing. It's a non-stop. And so a couple of the other younger Marines basically low crawled their way into the trench where they were protected from these rounds. And they're thinking like, we gotta make sure no one's in the trenches. And so they start clearing the trenches, but no one's in the trench. And it's just this constant barrage of gunfire. They have no idea where it's coming from. And then just as suddenly as it started, the gunfire stops and it's silent. As soon as the shooting stopped, the Marines did not just poke their head up and say, everything's fine now. If you're being shot at, you assume that even if there's a break in the gunfire, they're gonna start shooting at you again. And so for hours, they're just like waiting for the next round of fire to start, but they don't even know where it's coming from. And they're kind of isolated and exposed so they're all just kind of like hunkered down against the Hescos waiting to respond to the next volley of fire, but it never comes. And when the sun comes up, they're able to take stock of the damage to their OP from all the machine gun fire and from the rocket propelled grenade, but there's no damage. No one had ever been shooting at the OP. There was no damage. So they had no explanation for it. So when reinforcements arrived, they just wanted to pack their stuff up and get the heck out of there. And they did. After leaving OP Rock, very shortly after, Smith, Parker, and Diggs, three of the eight Marines that were there, were all killed in Afghanistan in separate instances. And then Sergeant Green, who was their leader, was very badly injured in an IED blast. Lena believes that when they were digging out those trenches and finding all those bones, that they unleashed something. It turned out a lot of people had lost their lives on that little strip of rock. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, they captured OP Rock and killed all of the Mujahideen that were located at OP Rock. 
Then the Taliban came in and they took back OP Rock from the Russians and killed all the Russians that were at OP Rock. Then Americans came in and took back OP Rock from the Taliban, killing all the Taliban that were there. So you have all these people, probably dozens and dozens of people that at one point have been holding OP Rock, that had all been killed at OP Rock. And so Lena believes that it's only a matter of time before this curse that they unleashed comes back to get him. So I'd love to get your reaction. What do you think happened at OP Rock? Is this paranormal or is there a rational explanation for this? Let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you enjoyed this story and you haven't done this already, please play Ding Dong Ditch on the like button's house and then also subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you have a story suggestion, we have a subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. You can submit your stories there. And if I intentionally use your story, I will certainly credit you. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Instagram, TikTok or here on YouTube or some combination. I'm just very thankful for your support. And until next time, guys, see ya. neighborhood in South Philadelphia where violence, drugs, and prostitution were just normal parts of everyday life. At a young age, like his parents, Michael became an alcoholic. He also developed a very serious drug addiction that he paid for by selling drugs. Michael would eventually drop out of high school and not long after that, he became homeless and was living out on the streets, sleeping in abandoned buildings at night to stay warm. In 1993, when Michael was still in South Philadelphia, he was arrested for the first time. He was charged with possession of an unknown drug as well as intent to distribute this unknown drug. Court records don't specify what drug this was. However, Michael just did not show up for court and so a warrant was put out for his arrest. Michael would somehow manage to evade police capture and by 1997, he had fled South Philly altogether and landed in South Florida in a town called Boca Raton. Shortly after arriving there, Michael was arrested for a second time, this time for offering an undercover police officer $15 in exchange for sex. Michael would plead guilty to soliciting prostitution. However, he would just get released. A year after the prostitution arrest, Michael was sued by a former girlfriend named Karen Tan, who claimed he was the father of her son. And so he owed her child support. And Karen had a DNA test that backed up this claim. However, Michael, again, would just not show up for court, and before long, Karen just gave up and dropped the lawsuit. Michael was likely very relieved when this happened, because at the time, he was making almost no money through a temp agency. And so after this lawsuit gets dropped, Michael decides, I need to go out and make some real money. And somehow, on his quest to find a more lucrative opportunity, Michael was introduced to associates of the Bonanno family. And the the Bonanno family is one of the infamous five families that dominates organized crime across the United States. They are literally the Italian mafia. And after the mafia met Michael, they took a liking to him and they did offer him a more lucrative, albeit illegal, opportunity. They gave him a role inside one of their so-called boiler rooms. A boiler room is not literally a boiler room. Instead, it's a group of fraudsters that use high pressure sales tactics to steal money from unsuspecting victims. Typically the way it works is the fraudster will cold call someone and they will tell them that they have this great get rich quick scheme, but you gotta give me your money right now if you wanna be a part of it. 
And so when the victim says, okay, that sounds great, and they wire the money along, the fraudster just steals their money. Michael, who was very charismatic and a natural salesman, got really good at tricking people into giving him their money. And so eventually, Michael realized he could make a lot more money if he started his own boiler room, where his commission could be much higher on the money he stole. And so fairly abruptly, he left the mafia's boiler room. We don't really know how they reacted to this. And Michael would set up not one, but two boiler room scams of his own in South Florida. And by 2002, he had pocketed $155,000 of stolen money. However, he had spent virtually all of it on fancy hotels and cars and phone sex. But the good times would not last for Michael because in 2002, the police caught on to Michael's boiler room scams and they raided them and Michael was arrested for a third time, except this time he would go to court, he would stand trial, and he would be sentenced to two years in prison, 28 years of probation, and he would be ordered to pay back the $155,000 that he stole. Michael would only serve seven months of his two-year jail sentence, but that was more than enough to leave a huge impact on him. Michael hated prison. He hated every second of it. And so during those long, sleepless nights that he was laying awake in his cell, he made a promise to himself that when he got out, when he was released, he would never, ever come back. And so in 2003, when he was released, he immediately entered a sobriety program. He also started going to the gym every morning and he began studying for his GED, which is a high school equivalency test because he didn't get his high school diploma. After he successfully earned his GED a couple of months later, he would also start a legal business. It was a digital marketing firm that was called Mad Money Inc. Over the next several years, Michael would do his very best to stay on the straight and narrow and not get in trouble. And for the most part, he did that. By 2008, Michael was still sober, despite a few setbacks, and he was still very focused on his physical fitness and his health, and his business, Mad Money, was doing quite well, earning him nearly $100,000 a year. But his love life had become a bit messy. Michael had gotten married back in 2007 to his longtime girlfriend named Maria Luongo, who had stood by him when he went to jail. But that year, in 2008, when Michael was 38 years old, he cheated on Maria with a 26-year-old real estate agent named Dahlia Mohammed, who he met at a Starbucks. And instead of their affair being a quick fling, as they likely both intended it to be, Michael and Dahlia quickly fell in love. And when that happened, Michael went to his wife Maria and he told her, and then he divorced her. Just three days after the divorce finalized, Michael and Dahlia went to the courthouse and they got married. The newlyweds would move into a brand new condo that Michael had purchase for them in Boynton Beach, which is a beautiful town in South Florida. And for a time, their life was perfect. They knew it was a little outrageous the way they had met each other and how quickly they had fallen for each other, but they didn't care. They got along great and they were excited about the future. But their perfect life would not last long. On the evening of March 12th, 2009, so only about a month after they had gotten married, Michael and Dahlia were at home in their condo when they heard a knock on the front door. And so Michael went to the door, he opened it up, and much to his surprise, standing on the other side was his probation officer, and behind him was a whole bunch of police officers. And before Michael could even ask what was going on, the probation officer told Michael that they had received an anonymous call tipping them off that Michael was selling steroids and ecstasy pills and other drugs out of his condo. Michael would tell the probation officer that there was no way that was true. He is not selling any drugs, he's sober, he's not doing that. And so eventually Michael just stepped aside and said, please come in, search my condo. I have nothing to hide. And so sure enough, the police, they would go into his condo, they would search it, but they wouldn't find anything and they would leave. And so after the police had gone, Michael and Dahlia found themselves just standing in their condo, completely dumbfounded. But instead of trying to get to the bottom of it right then and there about who had called and why, they just decided it was best for them to just leave their condo for the night and go stay at a nice hotel. And so they packed up some 
bags. They left their condo, which was a total mess from the police search, and they went to the hotel and they had a nice night together. The next morning, when they got up and headed down to the parking lot, they saw up ahead, standing around Michael's car, was Michael's probation officer, as well as several other police officers. And so Michael and Dahlia are looking at each other like, what is this, again? And so they hustle on over to Michael's car, and before they can even plead their innocence to Michael's probation officer, he stops Michael and just says, look, we got another anonymous call, this time telling us that you are selling drugs out of your vehicle, and so we need to search it. And so Michael is just totally beside himself, but he says, look, go ahead, search it. There's nothing in the car. And so sure enough, the police would open up his car, they'd rip it apart, but again, they wouldn't find anything. Over the next couple of weeks, the only thing Michael and Dahlia ever wanted to talk about was what the heck was going on. Who is placing these anonymous calls claiming that Michael was selling drugs out of the condo and out of the car? It just didn't add up. They wanted to believe that this was all just one big mistake, but in the back of both of their minds, they were thinking about Michael's very checkered past and his previous dealings with the mafia and with people he had clearly ripped off. And so maybe there was someone in his past that was looking to get back at Michael and maybe get him arrested and sent back to jail. Fast forward to March 29th, so 17 days after that first raid on their condo, and that night, Michael and Dolly had been eating dinner at a restaurant, and when they left and headed out to the parking lot, once again, standing around Michael's car, were several police officers clearly waiting for him to return. And so without even needing to ask why they were there, Michael and Dahlia, they go over to them, and they just start pleading with them to understand that this is a setup. We do not have drugs in this car. We don't know what's going on here. Please, you gotta understand that someone's doing this to us. But this time, when they searched his car, they would find something. Something. Before we go any further, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Experian. Back when I was just a young buck in college, I was broke. And so naturally, I took out a credit card with a $5,000 limit and immediately maxed it out on buffalo chicken calzones and beer. Now, as soon as my card got declined, I didn't pay it off. Instead, I just took the card, tucked it back into my wallet, and forgot about it. But the bank did not forget about my $5,000 debt, and my failure to pay it back wrecked my FICO score. A FICO score is a type of credit score. Over the last 10 years, I've been able to rebuild my credit score, but it has been a slow and painful process. And so my suggestion to you is to avoid the unpaid beer and calzone credit trap and just closely monitor your credit score. And with Experian, you can do that for free. In addition to closely monitoring your credit score, they will also send you alerts anytime your credit changes. Experian also offers a dark web scan. If you've ever been the victim of a data breach, and you may not know if you have or not, your information potentially could live in the dark web. And that's a place where criminals could use it to commit fraud. And if that happens, it'll wreck your credit along with a bunch of other horrible things, unless you catch it and report it. And on that, if you do find inaccuracies on your credit report, you can easily submit disputes and track those disputes on Experian's online dispute center. It is time to take charge of your credit. Get Experian credit monitoring, alerts, your FICO score, and that dark web scan all for free. Just go to Experian com slash Mr. Ballin. Again, that's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N dot com slash Mr. Ballin. Okay, back to the story. After searching Michael's car, the police would find a small bag of cocaine stuck inside of a cigarette carton tucked underneath his spare tire in the trunk. And when Michael saw them pull the cocaine out, he began to cry because he knew even though it was not his and he had not put it there, that he was going to jail because he was going to get arrested for possession and he was on probation and he was screwed. And so he just begins crying and pleading with police to understand that the cocaine was not his. He swears it's not his. Meanwhile, Dahlia, you know, she's looking at the drugs and now she's second guessing herself. You know, is Michael lying? Is he actually selling drugs? And he's been lying to me too. 
But when she sees her husband crying hysterically and looking so sincere, she believes that he's got to be telling the truth. And so pretty soon she was standing beside Michael and pleading with police as well to let them go, that this was totally just a setup. And amazingly, these police officers who were aware of the previous raids on Michael and Dahlia's property, they told them, look, we do think this is pretty suspicious that somebody keeps calling in about you selling drugs and now magically the drugs are in your car. And so what we're going to do is we're going to confiscate this cocaine. We're not going to arrest you. Instead, go home, be safe, call us if you see anything strange, you hear anything strange, and we're going to begin investigating to figure out who is making all of these calls. And so Michael and Dahlia were totally relieved to hear this, but at the same time, they were kind of terrified because clearly whoever was looking to get Michael in trouble now was prepared to break into his property in order to do it. And so what was stopping them from breaking into their condo and planting drugs in there as well? And so after these police officers left, Michael and Dahlia hopped in the car, they sped back to their condo, and they went inside, and they searched it top to bottom, looking for any sign that anyone had recently been in there, or if there were drugs, or anything illegal inside of their condo. And after looking and finding nothing, they just locked their doors, shut their windows, shut the blinds, and just prayed that the police would be able to quickly identify who was doing this to them, and make them stop. But over the next few months, the police would not figure out who this anonymous caller was, because the caller stopped calling. And so for a little while, Michael and Dahlia were convinced that the whole ordeal was over and done with, and they basically returned to their normal lives. But on August 5th, 2009, roughly four months after the cocaine was found in Michael's car, the anonymous caller would come back with a vengeance. On that morning at around 5.45 a.m., Dahlia left the condo, leaving Michael in bed, and she headed out to the local gym to get a workout in. Around 6.30 in the morning, she stepped off the treadmill and she looked at her phone and she saw she had a missed call from a number she didn't recognize and this number had left her a voicemail. And so she calls her voicemail, she puts it to her ear and as she's listening, her heart starts to race because it was a Boynton Beach detective telling her there had been some sort of incident at her condo and she needed to come back right away. Terrified, Dahlia grabbed her things and she ran out of the gym, she got in her car and she called this number back and when the detective picked up, she tried to get more information from him about what this incident was, you know, what happened. And the detective would only say that it involved her husband and he would explain everything when she came back. And so in a total state of shock, Dahlia turned on her car and she sped out of the parking lot and she headed back towards her condo. And when she turned onto her street and saw her condo, she hit the brakes and just stared. In front of her condo were all these police cars with their lights on and police officers were walking around and yellow crime scene tape was lining the outside of her property and in inside of the taped off area, there were all these crime scene photographers taking pictures of her condo. And so as Dahlia is sitting in her car at the top of the street, just staring at this crazy scene she's seeing, one of the Boynton Beach police officers sees her and walks up. And after confirming that she was Dahlia DiPolito, he said to her, you know, leave your car here and come with me. And so Dahlia, who knows, obviously something bad has happened, but really doesn't know the extent of it. She puts her car in park, she gets out and she begins walking with this police officer officer over towards this cluster of three people that are standing right in front of her property. And it would turn out one of them was the detective who had called her on the phone. And so Dahlia is led over and that detective, as soon as he sees Dahlia, he walks over to her and he says to her very matter of factly that someone had called about a disturbance in their condo and shots were fired. And unfortunately, her husband, Michael, was dead. Dahlia, who was totally hysterical, was gently led away from her condo into a nearby police car and they would drive her to the police station where they would sit her down and begin asking her questions about her husband. And they would say to her, look, I know you just found this out, but we got to figure out what could have happened because a killer is on the loose. We need to find this person and stop them. And so at first, the conversation was really just Dahlia crying and the detective kind of calming her down. But eventually, she would tell the detective about the anonymous caller who kept calling the police and claiming Michael was selling drugs and how she and Michael suspected that, you know, probably the anonymous caller was connected to someone from his past, maybe someone from the mafia, or maybe one of the victims of his boiler room scam, or it could be any number of other people that Michael had done wrong in the past. And so the detective, he's taking diligent notes and he's listening to Dahlia. And then at some point in a break in the conversation, he says to Dahlia, okay, it's time to get serious. I need to know if you know this guy. 
And so Dahlia, she was kind of looking down and she looks up confused what he's talking about. And then the door opens and this huge guy in handcuffs walks into the room. Come here. Bring this guy in here. Get over here. Get over here. You know who this guy is? No. You've never seen him before? I've never seen him before. Ever. Do you know her? Put your head up and look at her. Put your head up. I've never seen him. What were you doing coming out of her house? Get him out of here. It would turn out Dahlia was lying. She did know who that guy was. Almost immediately after marrying Michael six months earlier, she had stolen $200,000 from him, but apparently that wasn't enough for her. She needed the rest of Michael's money as well as his condo. And so she had been the anonymous caller. She was the one calling the police and tipping them off that Michael was selling drugs out of the condo and out of his car. She was the one who planted the cocaine in the back of his car because she wanted him to get arrested because he was on probation and he would go back to jail for a really long time. But when her efforts failed and Michael did not get arrested and so did not go back to jail, Dahlia moved on to plan B. She reached out to one of her ex-boyfriends and she asked him, hey, do you know any hitmen that could murder my husband? And the ex-boyfriend at first didn't think she was serious, but when she kept asking him about it and began offering to pay and really was making it clear that she wasn't joking around, the ex-boyfriend basically told her, no, I don't know any hitmen. And then he, the ex-boyfriend, called the Boynton Beach Police Department and told them about Dahlia and her plan to hire a hitman to kill Michael. And so when the Boynton Beach Police Department found out about this plot, they immediately had one of their undercover agents pose as a hitman and set up a meeting with Dahlia. And so the undercover agent was that huge guy in handcuffs that was led into the room with Dahlia. And so Dahlia goes to meet the undercover agent, the fake hitman. She gets into his car and there's a hidden camera in the back seat that's filming her the whole time. And she's caught on camera saying she wants to kill her husband. She gives money to the undercover cover agent. And then as she's about to get out, the agent turns to her and he says, are you sure you want to do this? Because as soon as you leave, it's done. I am going to kill Michael and you can't stop it. This is Dahlia's reaction. There's no changing. No, there's no, like, I'm determined already. I'm positive, like 5,000% sure. Like, no, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Like, as soon as you told me I was going to need the money from you, I went, I grabbed it right away. Like, we were good to go. Like, with me, you're not going to have a problem. You're not going to have an issue. And so the Boynton Beach Police Department, they have all this information about what Dahlia thinks is going to happen, and they decide they can use this information to set her up in the most elaborate way possible. And it just so happened the the very popular true crime TV show, Cops, was filming in the area. And so the Boynton Beach Police Department allowed cops to be a part of this elaborate setup. So they got to film everything that happened. So on the morning of August 5th, Dahlia got up and left her condo at 5.45 a.m. and headed to the gym, knowing, at least in her mind, that the hitman would be coming to her condo right after her, breaking in and shooting her husband twice in the head, because that was the plan they had come up with that was captured on film. And so after the police see her leave at 5.45 a.m., because they were monitoring the condo, they rushed in, they knocked on the door, and they got Michael to come downstairs. And he had no idea his his wife was trying to kill him. And so he comes to the door, he's totally confused, but he goes with them and he's kind of ushered off to the police station. And then for about the next hour, the police set up a very convincing fake crime scene right out front of the condo. And then once it was all set up, that detective called Dahlia and left her a voicemail saying that, you know, there's been this incident, you need to come back to your condo. And then a couple of minutes later, when Dahlia called them back and said, okay, I'm coming back to the condo now, that's when the TV crews for the cops TV show, they kind of set up in the bushes and got ready to film what happened next. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, ma'am, he's been killed. No, 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 he's, been, he's been killed, ma'am. I'm sorry. No, 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 Listen, no, no. Try to calm down. No. Listen, right now what no, we, do, we need to get you to the station. No, no, we need to get you to our police station. No, no, I can't let you in, man. We have to do our job. No. After the fake hitman was pulled out of the interrogation room after Dahlia had said, oh, I don't know who he is, the detective just stared at her in total silence for a minute. And then he broke the news that he totally knew all about her murder plot and that she was going to jail. Yeah. 
you're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? What do you want to do here? I didn't Dying do anything. It. Listen to me. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail. I didn't jail. do anything. Please, I didn't do anything. Don't tell me you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail today. As soon as I'm done, oh they're going to come in here and handcuff you and take you to the Palm Beach County Jail, book you for solicitation of first degree murder on your husband. Your husband is well and alive. Thank God. Oh, yeah, thank God. After Dahlia was arrested, she was still sitting in that interrogation room when the Boynton Beach Police Department made a special point of walking Dahlia's husband, Michael, past the open door so she could see him. Here's her reaction. Oh my God. She's alive. Come here, please. Come here. Michael, come here. Come here, please. Come here. Yeah. Why not? I didn't do anything to you. Mike, come here, please. Come okay. here. Okay. Mike, we'll take her back to Brooklyn, please. Dahlia was initially sentenced to 20 years in prison for what she had done, but after a retrial because of jury bias, her sentence was reduced to 16 years. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please ask the like button if you can borrow their car for the week and then spend that week driving around, picking up as much roadkill as you possibly can and packing it into their trunk and into their back seat and then return their car. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We now have a podcast called Mr. Ball.